Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Kurt Wiedegartner. And for my CEE 5003 project in remote sensing, um, I chose to study how the land use has changed um, around my home, hometown over my lifetime. So let's get into it. So I'm originally from North Carolina and more specifically, I'm from the Raleigh area. Um, Raleigh is actually the capital of the state. So it's a pretty large city here with a with a dense city mass in the middle. Um, I was I actually grew up and was raised more up in this area, which um, historically has been sort of farmland, a lot of forest, um, and the suburbs basically of, of old Raleigh. Um, and growing up here, it was it was really great. There was a lot of things to do outside. There were massive expanses of forests. Um, there was nice creek systems. There was a big lake. Um, a lot of area, a lot of green area, natural area to grow up and play in. Um, There's also a lot of open pastures and farms um, growing up in this area and early in my childhood. Uh, but it so happens that this area is also home to several cities, um, that being Raleigh, Chapel Hill, and Durham. And each one of these cities has their own large and well-respected university that being North Carolina State, University of North Carolina, and Duke. And situated right in the middle of these three large universities is what's known as the Research Triangle Park, or RTP. And this area, um, sort of the maybe the reason it exists, the RTP, is kind of a, an effect of these large universities. So there's a lot of young college-educated students in this area who are looking to get employed. So early on, a lot of tech companies and business companies found this area to be very desirable to set up their corporations because there was a large labor pool of skilled workers to pull from. And so some of the original companies, large companies in this area include IBM, um, SAS Institute, and GlaxoSmithKline. And these companies established themselves in this area quite a long time ago, and many of my parents and friends' parents, these are the kind of companies that they that they were actually working for. Um, it didn't take too long for several other companies to enter the area. These are some examples of that, followed by more and more companies over time. And some of these companies you may recognize are quite large. Um, here's some more coming in the early teens. And actually in 2018, both Apple and Google announced plans to launch campuses and in this area. Um, and so this has created a massive job opportunity for people to move to this area to find jobs. And so not too surprisingly, um, all I had to do was type in Raleigh or RTP area growth. And there is a plethora of news articles and um, clips about just how much this area is growing and how much it's poised to grow in the, in the future from today. And so my idea with this project was to kind of see how all this job growth has affected the land use in this area. So basically how much of this land has turned into this land. And in my own personal experience, I've seen this happen countless times um, where I grew up and it can be hard to see. Um, it's kind of disappointing and just just uh, something that I was interested in to go back home and look at through satellite images. So kind of my methodology with this project was to use landside imagery um, from the year I was born in 1996 to, to, to the present day. Um, I then plan to use supervised classification to differentiate different land use areas, and then calculates, or then use zonal statistics to calculate pixel areas, and use that information, and analyze and interpret my results. So to show you how that all worked, I will now enter the uh, Jupyter Notebook and show you some of my projects. So the first thing I'm gonna do is open a terminal and I'm going to install G 
GMAP. This is the first step in any Google Earth Engine project in this platform. And then how I did this is I, I started a different project for each year, or at least each year that had um, satellite imagery that didn't have clouds all over it or um, looked okay. And so that's what each one of these projects are. And so I'll go ahead and show you the process with the first year of 1996. So the first step is to call your GMAP. And then we want to define a um, area of interest. And for me, that was the Triangle region of North Carolina, which includes these three counties, Durham, Wake, and Orange County. And so the way we do this is by defining a rectangle geometry, and we label that as an ROI. Um, there's some more code in here to let you know just how large that ROI is. That information is right here. And then the next step in this process is to call your satellite imagery. And so this will be for the first year, 1996. We're calling Landsat, Landsat 5 data. And I tried to find, in each one of these years, I tried to find a time of maximum or a full leaf cover on the trees sometime in between the months of May to um, October. And so this would be, this is from the month of June in 1996. And then I clipped that image with to my ROI and this is the result you see here. So this is the satellite image of the RTP from 1996. So the next step in our classification is to make polygons around our land use areas. And so I chose different categories that we'll go through one by one. And, um, and I, I went into the image and I found that classification and built a little polygon around it and told the computer what that um, polygon represented. So for the first class classification, I chose buildings. And so I went in here and I found where the buildings were and I drew little rectangles around those buildings. This here is the airport. It uh, worked well because it was there in every image and it's quite large. So you can see these building um, polygons. And the way I did this was with coordinates. Um, I didn't actually draw them, I put in their coordinates. Okay, so the next classification that I did was with roads. And you can see here these polygons showing up around the roads. And for each one of these classifications, um, I kind of arbitrarily chose how many polygons to make for the smaller, for the much smaller, um, features like roads and buildings, I had to use quite a bit. Um, I used five road polygons and in the buildings I used eight different building polygons. And that was just to get enough pixels to make the classification stronger. Okay, so the next classification that I chose, I called it agricultural fields. And that was this area down here where the farmland is. And then we have, next we have water. So I drew, these are quite easy, these large bodies of water. I just drew several large polygons in them. The next was forest. Again, this was pretty easy. There's quite a lot of large forest land to draw big polygons and get a lot of pixel data. Um, and then the last classification I have is open area, or I called it grass. And this is kind of pasture area. Um, or just areas, open areas without trees or buildings. Um, so that is called grass in this, in this project. Okay, so the next big step in this process is we need to train the computer to recognize the land use areas that we designated in the last step. And so to do that, we pull in all of the polygons that we made, which are all lab labeled here. 
And then we tell the computer that we want to use all of these, all the bands that come from the satellite imagery, and we want to use them to predict um, what the other pixels are in relation to these. And so we can do that with this code. And then we use a training model and we tell the model to randomly split the data into 60% for training and 40% for testing. Okay, and so next, the next step is to actually use a classification that will take that all that information and then designate which pixel belongs to what classification. And in a previous notebook, I determined that random trees classification was the best at actually doing this. Um, I won't go into that for the sake of time, but random trees seem to have the highest accuracy. And so we pull this in to our, our notebook here, a random trees classification, and we tell it to start predicting the um, pixels based on all the previous information that we made. And then we use this line of code to um, to split to tell which um, which classification is going to be what color, and so we can make a nice colorful map this way. And when we run that, this is our result. It loads up here. Okay, so you can see I chose the forested areas to be this dark green. The open grass areas is a light green. Roads and concrete is gray and buildings are pink. So you can see this is working out pretty well um, based on what our satellite imagery looked like. This is pretty close to an actual representation. And if we zoom in, hopefully we can see some more detail here on what's what it's looking like. So you can see it's doing a pretty good job here of differentiating between the different land classes that I previously talked about. So the next step in this is to test the accuracy of our random trees classification. And we do this through an assessment. And this is basically a matrix saying which pixels are correct and which pixels are off and in what category they're off. And so we can see this is the amount of pixels for each one of our classifications. And it goes through and it gives us an overall kappa value. And for this particular map, that is 0.98, which is pretty high. So this is satisfying, um, and I feel confident that I can move on and use this code, maybe tweaking a few things in the rest of the years to create the same map, the same process for each of these um, years. Um, another thing that you can do to enhance the accuracy is run this code, which will tell you how many trees are best for your random forest classification, which was written out here. Um, I won't go and show that because it takes a while to load, but I, I ran it previously and it was telling me that 14 trees were the best, um, would give me the best kappa score for this. Um, another thing you can do in this notebook is add a legend to your map. So you can see here buildings are pink, roads are roads and concrete are gray. Farmland is um, yellow, water is blue, forest dark green, and grass is light green. So the last step in this notebook is to calculate our zonal statistics. So with this, with this code, it's, it's telling me the class and the sum. So the class is the uh, classification, and the sum is the square square meters of that classification. And so in this format, it's kind of hard to read. So you can run the next line of code, which converts this into a CSV format. So it's much easier to look at and export into, um, into another method for anal analyzation. And so that's the end of the result for this particular year. 
And just quickly, I'll run through 2013, just so you can see. It's basically the same, the same setup. The only difference is that I'm changing this year, um, this year's satellite image. So this is 2013 satellite imagery, imagery, and maybe you can already tell how many more neighborhoods, buildings, this big, big highway has been built um, as a difference between 2013 and 1996. And so again, we go through and we make our polygons. And for a lot of these, I just reused the polygons, but I did, as I got closer to the future, I did have to go back and make sure that the polygons from 1996 were overlaying correctly in these, uh, in these more future um, imagery, because obviously this land use is changing. So what was a field in 1996 may not be a field in 2013. And so that was important to do. And then again, we use all of our polygons to train this model. And then we use random trees to classify the pixels. And so here you can see the result of 2013. And then again, we test our accuracy. And For this, we get a kappa value of 0.92. So again, I go through and I calculate my zonal statistics, and then I convert that to a CSV. And then I can take this information and put it into other software that I can actually run statistical analysis on. And so to get into that statistical analysis, I will get back into here. And so you can see, again, this is our CSV format, and I was able to put it into a spreadsheet, and then I could actually uh, make sense of what these numbers were telling me. And so to look at the numbers, so from the years 1996 to the years 2022, and on our y-axis, we have square kilometers. And you can see the general trend of more building, more land being devoted to buildings and more land being devoted to roads. Um, we went from about 47 to 87 square kilometers of buildings and then 450 to 670 square kilometers of roads. And you can see how these lines in this data is not perfect. Um, if you were to go back into those random tree maps and really zoomed in, quite a few pixels are not necessarily correct. And I, I'll get into why that's the case later. But um, bird class project and just general coding. I think, I think I got some okay results out of this, but the fact that there's only 670 square kilometers of road in 2022 in a massive area like that is a little bit um, suspicious and it's probably not totally accurate. So now we can look at our grass, our pasture, open land and our farmland. And you can see a general downward trend uh, a reduction of open pasture, and this interesting upward trend of farmland. And to briefly talk about why I think this is the case of more quote unquote farmland being added, um, this is likely due to the fact that what I was calling farmland was actually just fallow fields or soil, um, plowed land. And so when the classification ran, I think it was also picking up construction sites and I call that farm, I was telling the computer to call that farmland. And so anywhere where construction was happening, it was classifying it as farmland, even though that's not necessarily the case. So I think that is why the general increase in this graph is because these numbers are being heavily influenced by the amount of construction that's going on. And one way we can kind of see um, that this was ultimately Somewhat successful is the fact that these two these two are remaining fairly constant over time. So our forests, they're not changing too much. And this is maybe a little counterintuitive, but if you know the area, um, the Southeast is covered in trees. Every, everywhere has trees. And so even though a lot of this deforested land 
was converted into um, suburbs and neighborhoods, they still kept a lot of the trees. And if you're looking at a um, satellite image from July, even if there's an entire neighborhood underneath, um, the trees are gonna overcover that. And so that I think that's why the amount of quote, uh, quote unquote forest land did not change too much. And then if we look at water, again, water bodies don't change too much over time, maybe a little bit. So you do see these are probably influenced by misclassification. But overall, the the, um, the change was not, not substantial. And so some things that I've learned during this project is that originally I thought I needed to make dozens of polygons, and then that would help make the algorithm algorithm better when I was getting kind of weird results. I was like, oh, I just need to go back in and make a bunch of polygons. But I learned that it's more important that you have correct polygons, polygons that are truly representing what is underneath them. Um, if you make a lot of polygons that have a lot of noise in them, that noise is, can really affect the uh, accuracy of your classification. Or at least it may not affect the, the accuracy, but it definitely affects the real world. So the computer thinks that what you said is farmland, but it's actually a construction site or it's actually a road. Um, the other thing that I learned is that uh, using 30 meter resolution for highly urban classification is quite difficult. Um, it's best to work with large homogeneous landscapes um, with this method. Um, so for example, classifying roads was quite difficult because not many roads are 30 meters wide. Um, and so it was hard to get enough pixels to accurate, accurately represent what is a road. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was a little bit, a lot challenging. Um, and the last big thing I learned was that coding from scratch can take a very long time. Um, so plan ahead. Um, if your code, if you reach a point in your code where it doesn't work and you can't figure out why it won't work, you have to spend a lot of time to figure that out because you cannot move on until that part of the code works. So make sure you have plenty of time before you start a project like this. And I'll end with some fun stuff that I was able to create, um, which includes the image time-lapse, which you saw in a few slides previous. And then I was also able to create an image comparison slider, um, which I'll go into briefly here. They're kind of fun to look at. Okay, so with this code, um, I was able to make a time lapse pulling single imagery from every year of Landsat data. So this goes from 1984 all the way to 2022. Um, you can see with this code, it's it's collecting 39 separate images. And then this code here is bringing in the time lapse, setting up my region of interest, start date, end date. Um, red, green, blue bands, um, how, how large it is, how many frames per second. And then this bit of code here is bringing in some text to show you which year is what. Um, and this little bit of code here allows you to actually download it and put it onto a map. So when we run this, it takes a little bit to run. So we'll give it some time to think. Okay, so it saved this GIF to this URL. And if I were to click on this URL, it would bring you to a separate page and you're, you're actually able to download the GIF. 
And we also have it set up onto the map. So you can see here as it goes through its, its progressions. So pretty interesting to see span of 39 years um, in a few short seconds. Pretty cool. Um, the second thing, second fun thing is a single image slider. So again, we set up our region of interest um, and we bring in Landsat, Landsat data. This time it's from 1996 to 2022. Um, we add our layer names. So this is naming each one of those images. We set up our visual parameters like this. And then here we bring it into a map. And so if we look here, zoom in a little bit, you can see we have Landsat 1996 on the left side and Landsat 2022 on the right. And you can play around with this and add any date here and any date here. And so when we zoom in, we can use this bar to, to slide and see how the uh, landscape has changed from 1996 on the left, 2022 on the right. So if you come here through here slowly, you can see this region here changing into developed land. Um, you can see, if we come down here, a lot of this region, which, which used to be farms and farmland has been turned um, into neighborhoods. So you can see as we drag through here, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, a lot of this, which is construction, it was showing up as farmland. Um, same with this, this is new road being built. Um, and that was all influencing the farmland pixels. So I think that's why there's some misinformation in, in some of the data that I got back. But overall, very cool project. Interesting to see um, what your hometown looked like in the year you were born, at least. Uh, some really cool information that you can do here on Google Earth Engine and with not too much coding. And with that, thank you.